In John chapter 17, beginning at verse 20, we come into the last section of this amazing prayer of Jesus. On the night that he was betrayed, the night before he would go to the cross, Jesus gathered his disciples for a Passover meal and for a heart-to-heart talk with those 12 men. And then when Judas left the room, there was 11 men in the room to talk to them about what life was gonna be like for them after he left them. These men had invested three years of their life to faithfully following Jesus and learning of him as disciples would learn from a master and a rabbi. But now Jesus was gonna cut their training short. It was time for him to go first to the cross and then to ascend to heaven. And he had to say, men, you need to get along and you need to learn how to live and walk after I depart from you. And so he poured out his heart to them in John chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. And now in chapter 17, Jesus knew that that work wasn't completed until he prayed for these men. And so for the last two Sundays, and now this being the third Sunday, we're taking a look at this absolutely unique chapter of scriptures, the only extended prayer of Jesus that we find in the entire Bible. First, in the first five verses, he prayed regarding his own relationship with God the Father. Then, from verse six all the way through verse 19, he prayed for the 11 disciples that were there with him in the room as he prayed. But now, starting at verse 20, if I can say this without being too melodramatic, he prayed for you. You'll see what I mean. Look now at verse 20 with me. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. When Jesus said, I do not pray for these alone, he had in mind the 11 disciples in the room that he prayed for. And very consciously, he had prayed for them. Now, we learn a lot through the way that Jesus prayed for those 11 disciples because his heart for them was very much the same as his heart for us. But Jesus recognized something, that his work would not end with those 11 disciples in the room, but his work would go beyond. That's why he says in verse 20, also for those who will believe in me through their word. Ladies and gentlemen, that's something thrilling right there in verse 20. Jesus knew that there would be disciples who would come after the 11. He knew that the work would not end with those 11 disciples, but rather it would go on and it would echo through the generations even to our present day. Jesus consciously knew that his work on the cross would be a victory. He knew his work would endure. That what started there among those 11 would spread until the present day where, ladies and gentlemen, there's more than a billion people who name the name of Jesus Christ as their Savior. Isn't that thrilling to know? That there's millions upon millions, thousands of millions of people here on the earth who regard Jesus Christ as their Savior. Jesus left this earth, or this earth, I should say, absolutely full of confidence that he wasn't going to be a failure. There wasn't a vague hope on the disciples. It was like, no, Lord, I'm praying for those who are gonna believe. And if I could say, I don't wanna be melodramatic here. I don't wanna be overly sentimental. But is it possible that in a way that is only possible with God alone, that Jesus saw every face of every one of the billions who would believe in him as he prayed that prayer? Now, such a thing is impossible for us. But for God, He could comprehend it. He could know the face. He could know the name. I guess what I'm trying to say is he prayed for you, starting now at verse 20. So what did he pray? Look at verse 21. You better pay attention. This is what he prayed for you. That they all may be one, as you, Father, and are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. When Jesus thought about the work as it would echo forth from those 11 disciples and as it would go out through generation and across the whole world, he could pray one thing to begin with. What do I pray for for all those who will later believe? I pray, Father, that that they would be one. 
It's as if Jesus envisioned the great multitude before the throne of God, of every nation, of every tribe, of every tongue, of every class, of every social level, and he prayed that they would rise above all of their differences and be joined together as one group, as one body of the followers of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why we reach out to unreached people groups. That's why we sense the unity that we have with other brothers and sisters over all the world. It doesn't matter what continent they come from. It doesn't matter what their social class is, what what their language is. We have a common ground in Jesus Christ with each one of them. We want this prayer of Jesus to be fulfilled. It's as if Jesus prayed this. He looked at those 11 disciples in the room and he said, Lord, I pray that they would be one. But Lord, in a way, their oneness is easy. They're all Galileans. They all come from the same language, from the same culture, from the same time. But Lord, there will be so many who believe after them, people from different places and backgrounds and experiences. Lord, I want them to be together as one. And I don't know if you've ever felt it. One of the, one of the real blessings that I've had in my life is to be able to do some traveling ministry in different nations, at different times, at different places. And I've met believers that I don't share anything with except Jesus. And I have felt such a unity in the spirit with those believers that I can hardly describe it. Why? Because Jesus prayed that we'd be one. And this prayer is answered. Now, when we look out among the community of Christians, you could say just in our own city or in the Western world or in the world in general, Sometimes it seems like Christians don't get along very well. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Why is it sometimes that if Jesus prayed for this great unity, why is it that sometimes Christians don't get along so well? I'll tell you, there's only one reason. Sin. Isn't it true? If I was without sin, and if you were without sin, together in Jesus, we would get along just fine. So if there's a problem between us, it's sin. And I tend to think it's your sin that's the problem. (laughs) Isn't that the way we're wired? But friends, shouldn't it just change my thinking and say, you know, Lord, really, is it I? Maybe I see the sin in my brother or sister that I think makes for disunity between us. But Lord, am I blind to some aspect of sin in my life? Lord, would you please humble my heart so that I wouldn't have a haughty or superior attitude towards anybody else in the body of Christ? That, Lord, maybe that sin is more than half on my side. I need to have that kind of humble, broken heart before God when it comes to my brothers and sisters. But notice in verse 21, Jesus says not only that they would be one, but that they would be one after the pattern of the unity of the Father and Son. Did you notice that phrase in verse 21? That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. In other words, our unity together as believers has a pattern, and it's the pattern of the unity between the Father and the Son. He says it there in verse 21, that they also may be one in us. That's our unity after the pattern of the unity of the Father and Son, and it's a unity in Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not together as Christians across the world going to have a unity of, let's just say, language. We're not going to have that. We're not going to have a unity of culture, but neither are we going to have a unity of institution. I don't think God wants us to have one. I don't think it would be a blessing if all the Christians in Santa Barbara or in America gathered under together under one great big super denomination. Why? Because when Christians have had that kind of power, they haven't used it all that well. I think that God doesn't want there to be institutional unity, nor does he want there to be uniformity. No, he wants differences and diversity. God bless the the differences in the body of Christ. I'll say something, and I I hope it doesn't sound too controversial to you, but I, I say it to our Bible college students. I don't know why I wouldn't say it to you. I believe with all my heart 
that if the whole body of Christ looked exactly like Calvary Chapel, that wouldn't be a good thing. It would be a bad thing. Now, I love what God does here in Calvary Chapel. I'm blessed by it. I'm not embarrassed about it all, and I want us to be everything God wants us to be, but I don't expect the whole body of Christ to look just like us. No, it's not a uniformity of institution. It's not a uniformity of everybody looking exactly alike. No, my friends, what it is, it's the unity of the Spirit. Just as Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, he said that we should endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Unity of the Spirit. And I can say I've enjoyed that blessed unity of the Spirit with so many believers from so many diverse backgrounds over so many years. You see, it is the gift of God. We endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe Jesus' prayer was answered. I believe that we don't make this unity in the body of Christ. I think we do what Ephesians 4.3 says. We keep this unity. Jesus made the unity, we just keep it. We just walk in it. And it's the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. But then look at the end of verse 21. This is kind of the kicker to it. That the world may believe that you sent me. When the world looks at the unity that exists among believers, it will believe that the Father sent the Son into the world. It would give strength and credibility to the Christian message. He wanted the world to see, and he would see it through the unity of God's people. Now, I believe that there is much more unity among the people of God than many people realize. I don't think that people understand how even though there's a rich diversity and sometimes disagreements among different groups, sometimes there are doctrinal controversies, sometimes there are diversities about what to do with experience, sometimes what we do in our church services, but in the core of it all, Christians are united on the fundamentals of the faith. And this beautiful unity, I believe, is a testimony to the world, just as Jesus intended. But then he goes further, look at verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. The Father shared the glory with the Son before the world's war. Now Jesus wants to share that glory with his people. And friends, let me tell you, where the glory of God is evident, unity is easy. It's where there's a lack of the sense of the presence or the glory of Jesus. That's where Christians tend to squabble a lot. But where there's a sense of God's moving and glory and greatness, unity tends to be much more easy. Again, that they, verse 22, may be one. Now verse 23. I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Again, Jesus speaking about this interconnectedness, not just for the 11 disciples, but for we who would also believe that we would be in him and he would be in us, that we would have that shared life together in Jesus Christ. Why? Look at the effect of it again in verse 23, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you loved me. Jesus here takes an idea that he introduced back in verse 21 and he expands upon it again. And what's the idea? The idea is simply this, that the world would know that Jesus was sent into the world by the Father, and that the world would know that his people are truly loved by the Father when? When there would be this unity among Christians. Again, I'll read verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me. Again, friends, let me just speak to the importance of love and unity among believers. It's something that we should have heavy on our minds and that we should be very careful about making any unnecessary divisions. We should strive to be one in the body of Christ, not one in terms of institution, not one in terms of uniformity, but that essential unity of the Spirit. 
But it's not easy. You know one of the reasons why it's not easy? Sometimes the most unloving and critical people in God's family justify it out of love. That's how they say it. They say it's something like this. I only demand that you be exactly like I am because I love you. Well, friends, that's not love. And, and, and that's not helpful in the body of Christ. We've got to let God work in our heart so that we understand that there can be a blessed diversity in God's family. But then there's a difficulty on the other end as well. Here's the difficulty on the other end. Sometimes correction and rebuke and confrontation is necessary and good in the body of Christ. Sometimes when there's air that needs to be confronted, say, brother, sister, you're going off the track here. Look at what the Bible says. There's air involved here and you need to bring yourself into conformity with the word of God. Sometimes, oh, no, 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 bro. We're just supposed to love each other and be one. But friends, we're not trying to have a unity of error, but a unity in truth. Do you see the difficulties? Well, one of them can be too critical. Well, one of them can be too allowing or too permissive. Oh, how we need the Spirit of God to help us to live properly in the middle. To, to not divide in the body of Christ except where it is absolutely necessary, but where it is necessary to have the courage to say, no, we're gonna stick with biblical truth. Ladies and gentlemen, these are difficult things. I just recommend that we throw ourselves upon the Spirit of God again and again so that we don't fall off on either side of the horse. You know, the devil doesn't care which side of the horse you fall off on just as long as you get thrown. But God says, no, stay with me. And if I could add one more thing. Jesus said that it would be a great testimony to the world when Christians were unified. But I don't think we should take that to say that if people reject Jesus, it's our fault. Now, sometimes it's our fault. So, sometimes it's true that our better testimony to the world, that if we were better Christians, more people would get a better vision of who Jesus is and what he came to do. Absolutely, that's true sometimes. But friends, that's not the only reason why people reject Jesus Christ. Remember what it says in John chapter three, verse 19. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. No, 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 the world does not have God's permission to fold its arms, cluck its tongue, and say, well, if you all were better Christians than we would believe. No, ladies and gentlemen, we have a responsibility as believers, there's no doubt. But much more so, people reject Jesus simply because they love the darkness and reject the truth. Now let's go on to verse 24. Jesus says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. You see that first line in verse 24? He says, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me. Now follow Jesus' context from verse 20. Who are the they also? It's those who would believe afterward. It's those who would believe from the witness and the testimony of the 11 disciples. It is, if you're a disciple of Jesus today, it's you. What does he pray for you? I desire that they, you, you disciples of Jesus, I desire that you also, whom the Father gave me, may be with me. Have you ever been very jealous of the 12 disciples? I have. You guys got to live and walk with Jesus every day. How I would love just to shake the hand of Jesus, just to hug him, just to hear him speak to me and look at the look in his eyes as he spoke to me. Has that ever occurred to any of you? It has to me. I want to be with you, Jesus. Or how about this? 
Do you ever find yourself really longing for heaven? I do. Now, I hope it's not just this escapist. You know, like I remember when I was young and in school, I, I wanted Jesus to come for me right before finals. Please, Jesus, please. <laughs> I'm not just talking about this kind of escapist, Lord, get me out of trouble. But just that, that recognition that can come into the heart of a child of God This world is not my home. I'm here, but I don't fully belong here. I belong in heaven with Jesus. You ever feel like that? I desire to be with Jesus. Do you? Friends, he desires to be with us. He says it right there. You saw it in verse 24. Look at the words. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me. Jesus longs for the consummation of all things. He longs that his people would be gathered together with him in heaven. Jesus longed for heaven's completion of all things. You don't desire to be with him more than he desires to be with you. And he longs for that completion. And he's gonna make it happen, my friends. He says, I want them to be with me where I am, verse 24, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. I don't understand this completely, but there is something about the glory of Jesus that is so captivating, that is so amazing, that is so layered and texture, that has so much to it that it will occupy the attention of his people throughout all eternity. We are going to behold his glory, and that will be a large part of what heaven's experience is all about. Now let's see how Jesus concludes this amazing prayer, verses 25 and 26. O righteous Father, stop right there. Do you see what he says in those first few words? Oh, righteous Father. In a few moments, Jesus was going to close this prayer. He was going to step outside and go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And once he stepped outside to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, it's like a domino gets knocked over. And you know how it is with the chain of dominoes? It just keeps knocking down until the whole thing is fulfilled. That's what it was. The first domino is about to fall. And Jesus knows what's going to happen. He is going to go to the cross and experience suffering that no human being has suffered. And I'm not just talking about physical suffering. I'm talking about spiritual and emotional, and even if you want to say it, psychological suffering on every level, Jesus would endure on the cross. And why is he doing it? He's doing it out of obedience to the Father. And yet, what does he say? Oh, righteous Father. Father, Even though I'm doing all of this and I'm going to undergo incredible agony at your instruction, I still recognize you as righteous and holy and I don't begrudge you it in the slightest. Start again here, verse 25. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And those have known that you have sent me and I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Jesus summed up his whole life's work by simply saying, verse 26, I have declared to them your name and will declare it. Again, my friends, I want you to understand that Jesus went to the cross full of absolute confidence in what he had accomplished and what he would accomplish. He didn't go to the cross fretful or fearful, but full of a bold confidence in his God and Father. I have declared your name and I will declare it. You will see me through to the end in triumph. And even though the world looked at Jesus and sometimes they said he's a blasphemer. Sometimes the world looked at Jesus and said he's a drunkard and a glutton. Sometimes they looked at Jesus and they said you're an illegitimate child. Sometimes they looked at Jesus and they said you're demon possessed. Jesus said forget all that. I know who I am and I know what I've accomplished and Father you helping me it will be done to the very end. He went with that kind of triumph, that kind of confidence to this end point, look at it here in verse 26. Friends, drink in these words. That the love with which you loved me may be in them. 
Who's the them? Start with that. Am I looking at the them? All right, nod your head knowingly, the them. Okay, I'm looking at the them. That the love, look at those words in verse 26, with which you, who's the you? God the Father, loved me, who's the me? God the Son, Jesus, may be in them. Do do you get this? Jesus prayed that the same love that the Father loved the Son with would be in you. How much does God love you? How much does the Father love the Son? How much did God in heaven love his Son, Jesus Christ? You tell me, the love for Jesus, little love? Great big love? But virtually infinite love? Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize how much God loves you? Jesus prayed that the same love that the Father poured out on him, that the Father would pour out upon you. As I say those words, I wonder if it's like a bullet that comes off you and bounces off because you have bulletproof armor on. Here's your bulletproof armor. I've heard it a million times before. Pastor, when I was two years old, I was singing Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I know Jesus loves me. Oh, do you? You really know that the Father loves you with the same love that he loves Jesus with? And why do you worry so much? Then why are you so afraid? Then why are you so stressed out? Then why don't you have the joy and the peace that comes from being so loved? When we do a baby dedication, there's something you can tell about a child when it has a lot of love. There's just a peace in that child. Don't you think God wants us to be his children having received that much love. So friends, can you just come back to it all over again and simply say, Lord, fill me with your love. I need your love. If you don't have it, you're missing the core of the Christian life. The essential place of love is in the Christian life and in the Christian community. And Jesus thought it was so important that he closes this epic prayer of his with that prayer for love. Because if we don't have love, his love in us and his love among us, we're all messed up. If you take love from joy, then all you have is hedonism. If you take holiness and take love out of it, all you have is self-righteousness. If you take truth and take love out of it, all you have is a bitter orthodoxy. If you take mission and take love out of it, all you have is conquest. If you take unity and remove love from it, then all you have is tyranny. No, but when love fills us and is present among us, all those things are present in a beautiful, glorious way. We need this love and Jesus prayed for it. I want to believe this morning that he answered that prayer, don't you? All right, I'm going to conclude, but it's not going to be a quick conclusion. I'm just warning you. I think the preacher has responsibility to do that. We've spent this Sunday and the previous two Sundays looking at this prayer, and I think it was the right way to do it. But you know what we've missed? We've missed hearing it from beginning to end. So I'm going to close simply by reading the whole chapter. You can follow with me. Let your heart thrill to these words. Put yourself in the right place. Jesus is standing with his disciples in the upper room just before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's poured out his heart to them, but now he must pray for them. And as he does, this is what happens. John chapter 17, verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. 
I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. They gave them to, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known all which you have given me are from you. For I have given, them, given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now... I come to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am and that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. May it be according to your word and your prayer for us, Lord Jesus. Jesus, it is possible that my prayer might be an error, might be an unbelief, might be based on a faulty understanding or limited vision, but Jesus, it is impossible that your prayer would be so flawed. So Jesus, we simply cry before you and ask that this great prayer, that we would be one, that we would be filled with your love, that we would behold your glory, that we would be with you. Father, we simply pray that you would fulfill this. Hear the prayer of your son as he prays for us from heaven. And Jesus, thank you for praying for us. Thank you for revealing something of your glory. Thank you for being our Savior. We love you. We praise you. And we give you honor in the blessed name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.